And our speaker today is Mark Andre, who worked as director of the environmental services for the city of Arcata for several decades since the 1980s. And he was instrumental in the development expansion of the Arcata community forest. After retiring in December of 2021, he remains city forester for Arcata, but also has extended his activities. He's probably busier than ever as a consultant to uh, a multiplicity of other projects, which he will talk about during the presentation. We look forward, we look forward to having Mark talk today, and he knows all there is to know pretty much about the community forest. Mark, it's all yours. Okay. <clears throat> well, with that, uh, thanks for sharing your lunchtime noon hour with me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me to talk about the Arcata Community Forest a little bit. And um, I think, by the way, Mark, I retired from the city. That was December of 2020. So time flies. So uh, about a year and a half ago. So um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the history of the forest, you know, where it is today some of the new new things going on and, 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 and touch on climate quite a bit because I, I've been involved in <clears throat> resiliency planning uh, for a seven county area. Of course, it's much different climate impacts to where we are in the Redwood area compared to some other areas I'll, I'll, I'll highlight, but there's a lot of similarities in terms of how you might manage for resilience. Um, because resistance is futile, so at this point. So I'm gonna begin with trying to advance my slides, okay? Uh, there we go, it's a little slow. Okay, so the Arcata Community Forest um, Mark, they aren't visible. It's got a share uh, screen. Hold on. I thought it was shared. Hold, give me a minute. Okay, we back. Yeah, you got it. I thought it was just on default. Sorry about that. Let me let me um make the slideshow. Apologies. Okay, we good now. We're good. Okay. So you you probably heard what I said, and now I'm going to advance the slides to talk about a little bit about the history of the Arcata Community Forest, which you know really really um historically. As the intro uh, stated, you know, it's located on unceded lands of the Weat tribe, 1800 to 1979. You know, it's kind of the period when Europeans came in and influenced everything here. Um, so lands within the community forest were mostly acquired through patents, you know, um, and there are some lands that were donated. Um, but really it comes down to this was the first community forest dedicated in 1955 in the state of California and one of the first in the West. Okay, I'm shooting my arrow screen and it's just not going down for some reason. So that's where I jumped, jumped out before. Um, Clicking might help, clicking your mouse instead of the arrow keys. Oh, I just have a pad, so. Oh, okay. Let me grab a mouse. 
Is that okay? Yeah. Definitely. He's searching among the trees. Hopefully he'll catch a mouse. We didn't test this out before. <laughs> okay, I, I just figured that page up, page down would work. Let that me, works. Uh, there we go. So really in 1935, the city acquired um, land from the Indian Water Company, um, which was the water supply for the city of Arcata. For many years, Jolly Giant Reservoir was, was the water supply. It served the city up until 1960s, actually, when the Mad River Wells went in on the near Glendale. Um, so it just was a watershed. A lot of community forests start that way, just just the, the watershed water supply. And the Jacoby Creek Forest was purchased in 1942 for $18,000, and it was also for future watershed water supply. And you can look back in the history, uh, the Arcata um, paper at the time, thought that was a real folly to be wasting $18,000 for a chunk of timberland so far from the city. Um, but that was a for a future dam site. Um, but when the Arcata Community Forest was dedicated in 55, um, about 500 people showed up at, the, at Redwood Park. And there was a telegram from then Vice President Richard Nixon congratulating the city, city of Arcata and the citizens for being for, so foresightful and, you know, establishing a community forest. Um, there was quite a bit of um, city council action in the seven in the sixties, really, to get let Humboldt State University use the forest for, for. Uh, a timber harvest plan and a road system for using it for general city purposes. It was, but Humboldt State at the time, Cal Poly Humboldt now, uh, forestry department was really active in the forest in the 60s. So quite a bit of um, timber harvest activity took place and then the revenue just went for general, for the general fund for the city. And there was no recreational access back then in the 60s. Perhaps, you know, just motorcycles and, you know, people, illegal trails, people didn't really hardly know about the forest that was right in, right in the city limits. So after Proposition uh, 13 passed, and I think it was 78, which really tightened the general fund or taxation, really property taxes, the citizens of Arcata reacted because there was a huge demand for park space in the city, park lands. So a ballot measure was passed in 79, which, which purchased most of the parks in the city that you're familiar with, like the community park, you know, where the community center is, Shea Park, uh, the Bayside Community Farm, that's the park, a whole bunch of parks. And, but the whole caveat, with that ballot measure was that the city would pay for it with timber harvest revenue and practice ecological forestry. And that has been the big challenge, I think, for the city to honor that, you know, stewardship directive of the, of the voters who voted to buy parks and log their forests to pay for it. So, that was a 20 year bond, it got paid off early. I'm not gonna go into details of why, but it was for a lot of good reasons. If there's time at the end, I can talk about it. Um, and then, you know, the city became the first municipal forest and this certified by the Forest Stewardship Council. It's a green labeling, really rigorous system. It was anyway. And for the next, I don't know, the last 20 years or so, it's, there's been a lot of uh, activity in acquiring more lands, which I'll go into more detail. This was Redwood Park in 1927. Um, 
that's the caretaker's house. There was an auto camp and it was on the uh, vacation circuit for people driving through Humboldt County. So today the forest consists of three tracks, the Arcata Community Forest, Sunny Bray track, and the Jacoby Creek track, which is the largest of the three, but they're, they're managed together as one community forest. That's just the same view with USGS topographic map behind. Um, for some reason that one flipped, but I just wanted to mention this. Can you see my arrow or do I have to, you can see my arrow, my point right now? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is the north end of the community forest. This is a conservation easement that was donated to the city, 185 acres. This is where the Arcata Ridge Trail goes from the north community forest to West End Road, if anybody's hiked that. But I want, I'm gonna talk all about conservation easements because that's important because the city has been actively trying to buffer the, the old community forest, the Jacoby forest by either conservation easements, preventing conversion to other uses or fee title acquisitions to put in the forest plan and manage for um, habitat, timber recreation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later. This is the Sunny Bray track, a little more detail. All these maps are downloadable at the city website and they're very accurate. And you can put them on your iPhones and hike around and tell where you are at any moment with a PDF uh, geo-reference type map. So back to that parkland bond in 79. Um, when people voted and they saw their, the little blurb of what they're voting for, their resolution was to buy, buy parks in the city, finance it, with, with revenue from the community forest and manage under the ecological forestry principles, which I mentioned and serve as a model of model forest management for others. And if there was extra revenue, use it for acquisition and development of parks and other open space areas, which, which did occur, has occurred. To me, these, these were influential people. Uh, Dale Thornburg, mostly on the upper left, professor at Humboldt State, um, who was my forestry mentor, and, and he was on the Forest Management Committee, the city's um, council appointed group of experts that's helped the city immensely over the years with uh, scientific credibility and guidance on forest management. Uh, Rudolph Becking also was influential to me at Humboldt State, and Dr. Jerry Franklin was University of Washington, but the two people on the left were, to me, more influential on the style of management of the community forest that you see today in terms of uh, ecologically based forest management that increases complexity, species diversity, using logging as, as a tool to speed up the successional processes to try to mimic what an old growth forest um, can function like. So I just wanted to, you know, shout out to these three people. So all those lands that have been acquired lately, many of you probably have heard about them. I'm not going to go through this whole list, but um, there's there's been a rhyme or reason to them, mostly either connecting the forest together so that we could have a feature like a five mile long ridge trail, a regional trail, or providing other management access, uh, or really, really the first thing I said was buffering the city's holdings from potential subdivisions, from potential conversions or that edge effect, um, like you see in the upper left, you know, just the influence on the, on the forest edge. And, and to protect the habitat integrity for wildlife and fish in the community forest. So it's really doubled size in size since 
since 2001. Um, this one here was donated by Cherry Klein LaForge, which was a pretty, pretty, pretty amazing donation. That when we valued that, it was worth eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and that was a complete donation. In terms of all these other folks, they worked with the city because they wanted to be part of a successful model, and they they wanted to be part of a community-based forestry um, that has the long-term viewpoint. So. This is the mission statement out of the city's forest plan. Um, it's all about stewardship. It's all about sustainability. It's all about community involvement and, and support by the community. Um, and it's all about trying to be a model that others could try to replicate. And in and, and that way, I think the city succeeded because over the years in my involvement, there, Numerous times where people um, had heard about the Arcadia Community Forest and, and wanted a, a case study, an example, because the community they were living in, whether it's Montana, British Columbia, other parts of California, Oregon, Washington, um, East Coast, Midwest, they, they wanted to replicate a similar style forest. And the county is doing the same thing with the McKay Community Forest and McKinleyville community also. So why, why does that resonate, I guess, with, with communities? So I think it comes down to um, local control and the resources are managed on, for the benefit of the local people. And you get these co-benefits like open space, recreation, uh, urban limit lines, a lot, a lot, a lot goes with the community forest, but in most cases, almost always, there is a management intent um, and a, also an intent to be self-sustaining in terms of uh, revenue. So since 1979, <clears throat> the city of Arcata has, has been self-sustaining in terms of the timber harvest revenue. And it has generated quite a few million dollars in, in grants by using the modest amount generated from timber harvest to leverage because um, many grants require cost share or um, a lot of some upfront expenses. So these are the still the goals of the community forest um, and they haven't really changed. You know, the, the new forest management plan that's, that's about to be released, it's an update of the, the older one, um, but it, basically adds all these new lands in and, and, and keeps these four goals as highlighted, you know, to produce revenue through forest products, maintain the health of the forest and provide recreation and, and still try to be that demonstration educational model, which the city's taken seriously. You know, I mentioned timber harvest revenue uh, has been used to buy other forest lands and park lands and also other easements and Humboldt Bay um, type wetland acquisitions and things. So it's really, it's been used in, in a lot of ways to, to leverage um, the watershed from the bay all the way to the headwaters. So in Arcata, how's the forest management? defined. It's an ecosystem approach, um, integration of restoration, conservation, and resource management. Uh, and it's really about combination of working forests, special management areas, or reserves that, that creates a balance. And, you know, if the city pushes it one way or another, um, it might not work because the three things that have to work all three have to work are the ecological, the social, and the economic. They have to work together or the thing falls apart. Ecological is the top tier. And um, 
that bottom there, I just put in red because it's really important for, because in Arcata, the whole program is designed to provide local residents an opportunity and responsibility to manage their natural resources, which, you know, it's owned by the residents. They are the stake shareholders or stakeholders. So, and this is going to get in, lead into some climate discussions, but um, over the years, the forest has been managed to grow large trees for ecological reasons, prim primarily, um, because it was an even age forest when the city got it. And it has been, you know, it's over 100 years old, but it's still even aged and fairly uniform, simplified. Um, in the 60s, when Humboldt State was helping the city manage it, almost all the whitewoods were removed. Um, Douglas fir, Sitka spruce, grand fir, um, because there was a market for those species and there wasn't a market in the mid 60s for second growth redwood. That's because old growth redwood was the primary market for redwood and there was still a lot of it being cut at that time. So I was taught and the city has been managed, this city's forest has been managed to mimic natural disturbances, really. Um, we've used Redwood National Park as a reference you know, a, a blowdown storm, you know, that creates a canopy gap. Fire, not so much, um, but maybe landslides, but primarily wind, wind events. And um, within the, what we, I highlighted the historical range of variation, which for most natural resource type restoration, you've always had a reference target um, to manage towards, but the historical range of variation is now changed with climate change that's asserting itself on the environment. So we have to keep that in mind, you know, in terms of ecological restoration, trying to recover an ecosystem that's been degraded and the Arcata forest is an example of one that had and how do we accelerate the recovery, uh, the functional processes, the integrity, the sustainability to be resistant to disturbance and resilient? Well, that works, you know, within the range of you know the kind of disturbances you might expect without putting climate change on as an added stressor. Um, so some people are calling the era we're in now um, the Anthropocene, which really is accurate in terms of describing the most recent period in Earth's history where human activity is now having a significant impact on the climate and, and the ecosystems more than anything else, really. You can also call it the Pyrocene, although not for coastal Humboldt yet. Um, but in a lot of other ecosystems, especially in the West, in Australia, Mediterranean, um, since we started burning fossil fuels, um, fire is is now, you know, I don't like the word uh, catastrophic. There's no fire science term definition for that, but unca uncharacteristically large wildfires are, are now, you know, becoming the norm. Um, I actually saw this guy give a lecture at Scripps uh, at UCSD in the mid seventies, Dr. David Keeling, who was the first person to, to really measure the CO2 level in the atmosphere and started the um, Mauna Loa station in Hawaii that's still, still measured. That's where the official station is for CO2 levels in the atmosphere, but his, his talk then in 1975, which now really dates me. Um, you go back and look at the, the charts and the graphs of the, the, the physicists back then, and it, they were like spot on, spot on. So we're now starting to pay attention maybe to having to deal with sea level rise and other 
other things in 2022. So I think we're way, way behind the curve in terms of what was pretty much known. So talk about forest resilience and sustainability. We, we kind of know it when we see it. I mean, in Spain, there's, there's forests of the same species that go on forever, same age. So it's kind of a cropland thing. You even see it in some redwood forest plantations, in California. And in Redwood Creek in 1979, which was a big influence on me when I came to Cal Poly Humboldt, um, all three of these type management systems here, um, there, there's, no, there's no reference in natural disturbance for, for them. So they're, they're just kind of artificial constraint, constructs. So we're at the point now, we have to embrace what's known and that's climate change, that's temperature increases, that's changes in rainfall patterns, changes in seasons. And um, we can choose to do nothing. That's a picture of the McKay community forest, by the way. Uh, lots of very young, dense forests. Um, the county, fortunately, is not choosing to do nothing. They're implementing a management plan to, to thin those unnaturally dense forests and to speed up growing larger, more robust forests um, with time. Uh, we can react after a big event like we've seen in the last few years, the August complex or down in the Bay Area, Santa Cruz or Plumas County um, and kind of blame this and that, throw money at it or, or be proactive. And that's, that's, the, that's the thing that attracts me and a lot of other people these days is to try, try to be proactive with advanced planning. Um, the three choices are really to respond or to, to resist. And that that's, like I said, kind of like paddling upstream in a canoe with time, but there are high value areas where resistance through a fire break or something, you know, say a special status plant that only lives in one place or something. We might do, might have to do that. Resilience is basically improve the ecosystem's capacity to, to, um, to resist or to, 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 to withstand stress. Stress could be temperature, it could be fire, it could be insects. Basically, like what Arcade has been doing since the early 80s, trying to grow older big trees, um, in, increase diversity, structural and species habitat diversity. The other thing is to transition um, and that's happening in some places, especially on the edge, edges of ecosystem um, or ecotones where enough disturbance with fire and then you change your uh, habitat from forest, maybe to oak wood, confer forest to oak woodland or even to chaparral or, a, you know, which is happening in the Klamath Mountains, Marble Mountains. The, the disturbance is so so dramatic and that it's changing the habitat types. So we're focusing on resiliency. And I think the state of California is funding a lot of projects that are aimed at our forests in this state, including the redwoods to, to be resilient and withstand the stress of natural events as well as climate induced. Um, layering on top of that. So basically, how do we do that? Grow larger trees, use prescribed fire, lots of prescribed fire, thin dense stands, and then use more fire, increase buffers, stock the seed banks, which the state seed banks can get pretty darn low, especially for certain areas like in Southern California that are like sky islands with conifers on them that have very restricted ranges 
and and the genetic um, seed banks for those are treasures that, that if you lose them, then then you never get them back. Just touching on our, not our area for sure, but the Southern Sierra, you know, and what's going on there is by far the most dramatic. I mean, there's parts of the climate mountains that are seeing the same thing, but the Southern Sierra back in the early part of the century was open, open, just you could ride horses through it. I mean, Native American burning was, was frequent. It kept the forest um, very open. Um, since that stopped, the Native American management and fire suppression came to be, uh, then you have dense, overly dense artificial forests, really, that are not very resistant to, or re resilient, I should say, to, to anything. Um, so some of the large fires of late have pretty much hit the reset button on the Southern Sierra. The mouse is a little sensitive, let's see. Some of the same things are going on in the Trinity Alps too. Reburns, type conversions becoming problematic in the climate. And it's not because fire is bad, it's good. You want more fire. And most of the fires, like the, you see the picture here, it's, it's a mosaic. You got some green, you got some burned areas and that, that's, that's good. You want that. Um, but when, when they are coming in every five years and um, they're hotter than what they used to be and the trees aren't big enough to withstand crowning out, then, then you get a situation that where the forest is, is being converted um, it's basically pretty simple. You just want to avoid simplifying an ecosystem. It's risky. Plantations are risky, um, for example, in fire prone areas. And lately, folks are kind of debating these two things at the bottom. Should we Put prescribed fire in wilderness. Typically, it's not done, but their let let burns of lightning fires is is something that is done. And now, do we plan for assisting migration using the climate change projections that that are out there? Uh, for example, doing the unthinkable ten years ago would have been moving trees like northward in terms of their genetic uh, seed sources and their and their their gene pools um that used to be a taboo but scientists are saying do that as soon as possible now there's ruth lake where our drinking water comes from i was up there uh in march the humble bay municipal water district is um reforesting lands and so is the Six Rivers National Forest. I mean, that, that was a pretty hot fire, that August complex burned basically from Ruth Lake to Red Bluff. Unbelievable. And there are vast areas where there aren't any mosaic areas of green um, for natural seed dispersal. So artificial regeneration uh, is probably one of the ways to make it happen. This was mid-March. It felt like it was 80 degrees when these these crews were planting out there. Fortunately, it rained a bit in May, right? That was great, April and May. Um, some other examples recently. This is giant sequoia, different than a coastal redwood, um, gigantea. This is mountain home demonstration forest on the top. Uh, it burned pretty extensively last year. And um, some of the trees in that forest, including the one on the right, were 2000 years old and they're, they're dead. They, they weren't able to resist the intensity of that fire. 
and in the national parks, they they tried to you know do dramatic measures such as putting heat shields on the trees so that they could withstand that fire. But something like ten percent of the giant sequoia uh, have had mortality from fire in the last five years. I spent some time in Big Basin State Park in Santa Cruz last year. Different, whoop, sorry, different scene there than Humboldt County, although it's it's redwood forest type, a little higher humidity, I mean, higher temperature, lower humidity. Um, and in areas that look like the redwoods are dead, they all survived, except for the ones maybe 10 inches in diameter or less, or the ones that were next to or close to structures that had a big thermal heat mass that actually cooked the redwoods, so they, they died. But most of the coastal redwoods down there survived, except for the ones that um, had their bases burnt out. And there was plenty of those to where they structurally couldn't stand up anymore and the bark or the uh, holding wood was too thin, so they blew down. But in terms of mortality, uh, most of those redwoods survived, which shows the ability of redwood. And this is the most southern grove of redwoods in uh, southern Monterey, or it's really close. This is like 30 miles from the southern limit. And I've been going to this uh, stand for a while. Um, it didn't look so good last summer. <laughs> uh, this is in Big Sur. And there's, this isn't an area that burned necessarily. These are, this, these are trees that are dying from most likely water deficit, drought stress, lack of fog. So this is the edge of the species range, long ways from Humboldt County. Uh, but the fact that redwoods have persisted there um, I think it bodes well for Humboldt, Del Norte, Mendocino Coast for, for not having this kind of stress for at least a, a long time from now, if, if ever. So just to hammer that point home about restoration and how we have to rethink um, how to manage within you know, an ecological, the ecological parameters of an ecosystem um, because those natural disturbances we're used to managing for now, how, but there's no analog in the past for the current and future you know, climate regime we're in. There's Big Basin State Park again, a redwood forest, 18,000 acres. All of the, all of the grand fur I mean, the Douglas fir and Tannum pretty much did succumb to the fire. So there's some ways you can mitigate, perhaps expand some forest areas. That's going on in some parts of the world to so soak up carbon, but may not be advisable unless those forested areas are, are you know, able to uh, not be too simplified in terms of plantations. It might work for a while. You know, I'm a big advocate for using wood instead of concrete and steel, just because the, the amount of carbon in, or CO2 that's used for concrete and steel is, is far, far higher than um, wood products. Um, mass timber, hopefully we'll see more of that here. Hopefully maybe Cal Poly Humboldt, some of their new, new buildings will incorporate that. Um, forest carbon projects, you know, it's a mitigation strategy. Uh, Arcata does have three carbon projects. They were set up primarily for, for others to learn, you know, and two of them in Jacoby Creek, one of them on the Sunny Bray um, tract, which for demonstration purposes uh, are great. And, it, and, it, and, it, and they are producing genuine, you know, um, carbon additive, you know, additionality just through their management. It's a hundred year commitment the city made on those. So those carbon projects, well, I should say in general, carbon projects are an incentive for landowners to do what I was talking about earlier, growing bigger trees, more volume per acre um, and, and getting paid to, you know, 
push put your forest in that condition um, in the near term. By the way, that whole sunny break forest um, or tract was a really interesting. Uh, there was five grants that went in to that. Um, the landowner had an approved timber harvest plan, R.H. Emerson. No, I'm coming back. Um, oh, okay. or Sierra Pacific industry. And um, a neighborhood group got the attention of the property owner and the city. And then that large company, the largest landowner in California, Red Emerson, uh, called the city of Arcata and offered to sell it to the city uh, because they didn't want the headache of people not liking what they were doing. So that 171 acres was purchased in 2006, followed by a couple other acquisitions of 114 acres in 2007, um, another 22 acres from George and Mary Schmidbauer in 2012, and a couple other cobbled together small pieces to, to create a 330 acre unit there in Sunnybrae um, from a willing landowner and five different funding sources. It was the most complicated thing I've ever worked on. And now there's a carbon project on it, which um, it's pretty cool. You can, you can read the history of all, all, all of this stuff on the city of Arcata's website that if you Google um, Arcata City Forests, I think you, there's, there's a wealth of information there. So anyway, at the state level, shifting back to climate, um, two, two big state actions, the forest carbon plan of 2018 and the uh, wildfire and forest resilience action plan of 2021 are now directing California's investments in, in forests into the future. The carbon plan I was able to help uh, be on the team when I was on the board of forestry um, and fire protection to contribute to that one. And, um, you know, the Arcata forest and Redwood forests are fe featured in there. And there's a lot of goals and objectives that are, that now policy is being um, created to implement those goals and directives in, in that forest carbon plan. Just some nice shots of the Jacoby Creek Forest on top, following thinning, following timber harvest and the community forest on the lower left. And where all those people are standing is in Redwood National Park. Uh, um, maybe some have heard about the Redwood Rising um, effort there. And that's largely funded with state grants that that forest carbon plan that I mentioned um, kind of set the stage for and money through the climate investments fund through the air resources board. And in Redwood National Park, the Save the Redwoods League and the Park Service um, have a very ambitious goal of thinning perhaps 70,000 acres of super dense, super young, forest that was part of the expansion of the national park and the state park uh, in um, Del Norte County and Mill Creek watershed, which similar to other young dense forests of redwood um, have almost zero understory vegetation and hardly any um, you know wildlife use. So the goal in Red National Park um, on those 70,000 acres is just a bigger scale of what Arcata has been doing here, thinning to produce, to speed up, you know, getting trees like this. So you don't have, you know, tiny ones forever that they get bear damage and, and fall apart. So it's, going on right now in, in a national park who would have ever thought that would that would occur. Um, so back to Arcata, what makes what makes it work <clears throat> for Arcata? 
I think it's all about the citizens embracing their community for us, having um, a stake in it and, and having a sense of pride in, in, in the forest and understanding that it's not just another park, that it's, that, that it's something you know beyond that and becoming involved, whether it's removing invasive plants, building trails or coming to the forest management committee meetings to, to kind of you know share concerns or to learn or to um, help craft what the city's long-term vision for the forest should be. Um, really, there's been an unbelievable amount of volunteerism that's gone into this forest. Probably the most gratifying part of my involvement was, was working with the people who have an interest in it. And um, it's not just about recreational use, but it's about that educational aspect. Uh, and um, young kids who grow up in Arcata, you know, who, who have a day of involvement even, you know, it sticks with them through their whole life. And they, they kind of um, develop that sense of place uh, and protect the forest in the future when, when it comes time for maybe voting for a ballot measure for open space and forest protection or whatever it might be. Um, adding, adding key lands, for example. So um, on a bigger scale out in the Jacoby Creek forest, a lot of, this is a 10,000 acre watershed um, this is the Jacoby Creek Forest in green. This part was acquired in 2020 from the Swainer sisters. These, this 80 acres was acquired in 2019 from again, R.H. Emerson, uh, Sierra Pacific. And this green area was acquired through the city's assistance to um, Cal Poly Humboldt. The whole idea was trying to block this area up um, to keep it intact, you know, a large area um, for public uses. Public uses include, or we're really hoping to have more tribal involvement in, in cooperative management, co-management, and use for cultural purposes of this forest. Um, some of these areas in black outline are potential future acquisitions, but since Arcata had, has put so much, and the funding agencies, federal and state, um, effort into restoring lower Jacoby Creek for fish primarily and, and other wildlife species, um, waterfowl also to protect this the integrity of these downstream investments by uh, keeping the headwaters from being either uh, simplified into plantations or worse by far converted into um, for residential uses and the roads and everything associated with that so um, this is a big focal point for, for, the, for the city's effort on a larger scale to use the small forest that the city acquired in 1918 as kind of a, a keystone piece to, to expand and add to. So this, this has been pretty, pretty cool. Um, I think if you want to look more uh, on the city's website, you can you can you can find more about the uh, the forest management plan. There's some videos on there, um, links to the forest carbon projects, and and other things. I put that North Coast Resource Partnership tag in there because um, you'll probably be hearing more about about this. It's it's, it's there's more efforts by the seven counties, including Humboldt tribal governments to but to put more local um, priorities in place in terms of where forest management should be going in, in the north coast region 
Um, and um, that's a whole different talk, but the North Coast Resource Partnership, if you have an interest in sustainable forestry and some of the latest research, um, I would suggest you go there and you could learn. There's a great, it's a great website. You could learn tons from that. So um, I know I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. I just wanted to pop one more slide in because I, I know this is going to be one because somebody gave me a heads up. Um, so one of the projects that the city has funded is the Arcata Ridge Trail. This would be on the south end. This is um, right at Margaret Lane, I think it is. And the north end is West End Road. So this is a five mile long. Um, regional trail. So what, what triggered this really? Um, the acquisition of the 171 acre Sunnybrae Forest and the donation of this 185 acre conservation easement by a generous landowner who, it was zoned residential by the way, in the unincorporated part of Humboldt County. Um, created these nodes that just look too irresistible to try to, you know, stitch together some additional land. So that led to this 22 acres. Later, this two and a half acres from Ted and Cindy Humphrey, local residents, and then Green Diamond Resources Company selling this part and another little part, little part, and an easement here to, to enable this, this. So it became kind of a rallying cry, you know, in the local area, the Arcata Ridge Trail was, was a feature, but the lands that were acquired for it included a lot more <clears throat> lands that had, that were, the co-benefits were watershed protection, wildlife, timber management, and other, other things, but, This is the only part that hasn't been built yet. And it's it's slated to be built, I believe, this, this summer, but I'll have to check in with the city just to be sure. <laughs> so anyway, um, I know a lot of people are wondering when, when the Fickle Hill crossing will happen. So um, I left the city, it was, it, was, it was close to being done. So I was going to um, say that's just a kind of a high level history of the forest. There's much more detail I can go into. But um, I would say if you have an interest, um, look at the Arcata's um, web page, keep track of the, the new forest plan update, which is really kind of a steady as, as she goes kind of carrying on the, the, the current style of management in a lot of ways. And um, leave with one, one thing about the forest that always that always stuck with me um, because it kind of speaks to how the Arcata Forest is known in other places. Um, and maybe the local folks don't, don't realize that, but there was once upon a time, I got a call from, it was the British Columbia timber firm called Macmillan Blowdell. Um, their CEO, they own, they own two, well, it was in hectares, but equivalent of about two and a half million acres in British Columbia. And they had just been locked out of the European lumber market because they weren't FSC certified. And the reason they weren't FSC for Stewardship Council certified was because of their style of management, large scale clear cutting. So. They'd heard that the Arcata Community Forest was certified. So, <laughs> I mean, there are other places they could have went. I don't know why they picked our little postage stamp of a forest, but uh, they said, can you give a tour to our couple of our foresters? So I said, sure. And it, you know, a couple of days later, their, their private jet landed in McKinleyville and they, they sent like eight or nine people. Um, 
to learn from Arcana's example so that they could they could go back back to British Columbia and change their their management style. And that was that was pretty amazing. But there are more stories like that that, that I I can tell about my time with the city of Arcata and and the little tiny town forest that you know uh, has had big influence in other parts of the state. So with that, I think I've used up my hour. So I'll turn it to questions. There are a whole slew of them in the chat if you want to go through them. Mark. I see now. There we go. There's 13 of them. So I'll I'll go in order. Okay. Has the value of redwood diminished over time? To what extent does the logging pay for the cost of maintaining the forest? Okay. and also help purchase new areas. Um, compared to a lot of other commodities, the value of redwood, you know, probably hasn't increased that much. This year it's $1,200 per thousand board feet, um, which is far higher than Douglas fir, which is $600 per thousand board feet which is far higher than Grand Fur, which is $400 per thousand board feet, which is a lot higher than Sitka Spruce, which is zero. So over time, you know, the value, Redwood is probably the, the you know, for forest management in California, it's the highest value species. So uh, we got that going for us. And, um, it has kind of maintained its its higher value over time. I mean, other costs go up, logging, price of diesel, labor, land and everything else, but it's been enough. So it's, it's paid for all of the city's operating expenses for maintaining the forest, and not just the trails, um, picking up the garbage and pulling invasive plants, but trying to, um, you know, entice, more science and research. And, and, that, and that's where Cal Poly Humboldt and the city's partnership has been huge over time because without research, without science and data and monitoring to inform your management, then you're just blind. You know, you just, you have to have that feedback loop in place. So yes, and the city's timber harvest revenue have um, been very careful, try to use, you know, the least amount is necessary, but to leverage other grants, to pay for appraisals, to pay for inventories, to pay for attorneys and due diligence for uh, land acquisitions. So I think I got that question. What's the next steps to increase resilience in the Arcata forest? Um, at this point, there's a lot of those new lands that are being amended into the city's non-industrial timber management plan um, that are younger, maybe, and haven't reached the condition like the Arcata Community Forest right behind uh, off Fickle Hill or off California Street or off Diamond Drive. So those, those lands are going to be uh, thinned so that they can increase their growth, get older, and more, more resistant to disturbance. Um, thinning, like a lot of people are, think of all the acres of um, fire prone areas that need to be thinned um, just so that fire doesn't, you know, have a higher, high, higher intensity or more damaging impact. And, there aren't that many acres that the city has that are that are that pre-commercial sized. You know, they're they're mostly a little bit older than that. But there's plenty of that in eastern Humboldt County, uh, northern Humboldt County, um, and on the Forest Service lands that that need those treatments. And in that seven county area, I'm talking where we've been talking about. Do do we plan to do prescribed burns in the forest? I, I hope so. Um, prior to European settlement, um, Native American burning in redwoods was the predominant type of burning because lightning wasn't so much of a factor. 
although that Santa Cruz big base in Santa Cruz County, San Mateo County um, fire was caused by lightning. And, and that was pretty darn extensive. That really opened my eyes to what possibly could happen someday in Humboldt County. Um, because that was that was redwood type and it and it and it burned hot. So prescribed some prescribed fires, mostly <clears throat> they've been used in Humboldt County for cultural purposes around prairies, like in Redwood National Park, you, to keep them open or oak woodlands. Um, and for for reasons that you know were for food gathering. Or, or for or for for specific reasons that that I don't know about. So we hope to learn and and have more more tribal <laughs> involvement in that regard. When I ask about four inch thinning, I notice we have a lot of small trees in in the community forest, and I don't know what you consider small, but as you walk through, you see if if we're aiming for a density of of basically. 20, 30, 40 feet apart, our forest is certainly not built that way now. Our, so are we trying to actually gradually take out the smaller trees and is it ac actually economically viable to do so? Um, it's only economically viable if they're merchantable size, which is about 10 or 12 inches diameter at breast okay. height. Um, and that's that's ec economical. In Arcadas, depends on what part of the forest you're looking at. Um, but in the Arcada community forest, um, the older stands are you know about 100 trees per acre. Uh, some of the Jacoby Creek recent acquisitions are 400 trees per acre. Mm -hmm. Redwood National Park old growth like Prairie Creek um, or Lady Bird Johnson Grove or 20 to 50 trees per acre. So slowly thinning, you know, you don't want to shock the system and thin it to 20 trees per acre and then have everything blow down. It would look really bad. It's, it's kind of a long-term process, thinning process to, to widen that spacing. So it's economically viable for sure um, in Redwood to thin stands of any commercial size. You know, it, 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 there's a profit margin to it. Um, Wendy, question about historical evidence of natural recurring fires in our areas. Yes, and, and there's fire scars that um, date those fires, and um, they're, they're, they're a long in interval. I think it's more in the range of 70 or 80 years, as opposed to, you know, 5 to 20 in like Trinity County in the Douglas Fir region. So there, there is a historical record and it's preserved as fire scars that I wish I had a graphic to show you that show up in the tree ring um, analyses. And those, you know, we're basic California is in, in the driest cycle since medieval, you know, it's 1200 years really since it's been this dry. So in terms of reference condition, That was a lot different, you know. The forest in the Sierra looked a lot different. The coastal redwood may maybe didn't look that much different, and there's enough soil moisture still with with being, you know, this this climatic regime we have now, um, so that it's not a limiting factor for coastal redwoods. Light is typically what's the limiting factor for 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 tree growth, not soil moisture. Um, and we're actually, some research by Steve Sellett, Dr. Sellett and others are showing that redwoods um, with an increased temperature and more light, less fog are increasing their growth rates still um, without that limiting aspect of temperature, which, or I'm sorry, moisture, which that earlier slide showed the stress happening in Monterey County. How much fog has diminished and to what extent does it affect our forest locally? That's a really good question. Um, there are lots of papers about that, but 
in the summertime, it equal, it's a lot of soil moisture wicked out of the <clears throat> fog by by redwoods. They're set up to do it with their needles the way they are to to, and it it's important for the trees, but it's also important for all the uh, understory vegetation and other other critters, amphibians, uh, for example. So. Um, I don't know the answer to how, how much, I mean, climate changes naturally a bit with, you know, pulses here, pulses there within a certain range of variation. But I know since I've, I've been here and, you know, Forrester's time of 40 years is working in the woods as a snapshot in time. So you can't really use it for, for much, but uh, it's diminished quite a bit. And, uh, we notice it a lot in, in the Arcata Forest when we're doing timber harvests because we never used to have to order water trucks for dust control because ah, it's just going to fog drip and it, it'll be moist enough. But that was never a thing to budget for was applying water to the roads for, for dust control. But I can follow up with research on that because um, I do have some papers on, on my hard drive about it. I had heard something on the order of like thirty percent. Yeah, and that's that's that's, that's 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 been that's that's right on. That's the ballpark. Yeah. Uh, do that's big fires amazing. burn the soil to such an extent that trees can't reseed or regenerate? It depends on where. I mean, certain species like gray pine, knob cone pine, culture pine, they need a hot fire to open their cones. So you know. California in general is fire adaptive ecosystem. So without fire, it's not a good situation. So it's just a matter of the large hot fires that are fueled by excess fuel loading, which hasn't ever been seen before in history, probably, um, can cook the soil and, um, but not to where you can't recede or regenerate but perhaps sometimes if there's clay, depending on the soil, you can make it hydrophobic so water bounces off of it and, and doesn't sink in and runs off and causes erosion and, and other impacts and watershed issues. But um, I haven't seen it sterilize the soil completely. Um, but on those, where you have, you know, on those edges, you know, like from conifer to oak woodland uh, where it's just it's kind of marginal where you're kind of blending the ecotones um, that's where you might have those, those soil impacts where the so soils are thin to begin with and don't have um, as much buffering capacity is the city still promoting carbon projects beyond what it's doing um the city's committed to 100 years of managing and reporting on the three carbon projects. Um, and how does a carbon project work? Basically, it sets up a baseline, which is based on regional average data for what the average redwood forest uh, has in terms of biomass per acre. And it commits to growing beyond that. So above that baseline increasing over time that's the part that's additional and that's the part that's uh, has an economic value so this the city has you know it's but it's super expensive to set them up and and the modeling and we're already doing remeasurements now from 12 years ago of permanent plots in sunny bray and in jacoby creek that have to be you know verified by third parties and they reported. And so it's, it's a lot of um, admin, administration. And I think on the scale of the city size projects, it's not, we've now realized it's not viable. I know Arcata has tried with others to have the state and other verifying or um, registries, carbon registries. The city's under the climate reserve which preceded, and that was a voluntary market, preceded the uh, compliance market that came later um, that the Air Resources Board in California now 
is in charge of. <clears throat> it, it gets complicated, but um, Arcata's carbon, net carbon increases are real, they're verified, they're measurable, and we were hoping it would be an incentive, a tool for other landowners to, to participate with because the more people that, you know, maybe grow trees 110 years old instead of 60 years old means more carbon on the landscape, more carbon sequestered. Um, and then all the other co-benefits, wildlife, etc. So um, it generated probably for the city so far eight or eight or nine hundred thousand uh, dollars. But the costs are going to, you know, accrue over a hundred year period for those re-verifications and re-inventories. So I'm not a hundred percent certain it'll it'll but it's probably it'll it'll ex, you know the revenue will exceed the cost, but at what ratio I'm not sure on in the super long term. Unless the protocols are simplified a little bit because they're they're kind of onerous on small projects. So the economy of scale really, if you have 10,000 acres, it's almost, yeah, you can say it's, it's completely viable economically. Um, getting less than that, maybe it, it's, it's harder. So we've been advocating for aggregation of lands so that smaller landowners can aggregate their ownerships into a larger project and participate that way. So the American Carbon Standard uh, is one of the schemes, I shouldn't say schemes, um, systems for registering a carbon project. They, they recently embraced aggre aggregation and we're hoping that'll happen to the, um, yeah, the compliance market too, because there's a lot of landowners who would like to participate. Um, so who buys the carbon? That's, that's a good question, another good question. But um, it could be a, a company. It could be used for sequin mitigation. It could be an individual. Um, some of Arcata's Jacoby Creek credits, I was at the San Diego, the Lindbergh Field in San Diego Airport and the big screen showed a pick, you know, how, how you can offset with your ticket purchase from that project. So that, that would surprise me to see that. Um, so there's often, as with anything, you learn with time. And I think Arcata's lessons probably are, um, support the concept of forest carbon pro as one of the solutions to you know to mitigate climate change because you know it definitely works in terms of arcadas forests have over 500 metric tons per per acre of carbon compared to the um baseline which is like 230 and and the, and the arcada can't ever drop below that in the future. So it kind of lock, locked in a carbon positive, you know, management system. But really it was all about that whole model of the forest. Can we, can we do something that others can learn from and, and uh, learn from our mistakes, learn from our, you know, uh, the good parts, the bad parts, and, but basically to, to be there for others to learn from, to emulate possibly. Arcata has often been a homeless refuge. How is that being handled? Um, well, <clears throat> the Arcata forest, I don't know how it's being handled most recently, but there was a federal court decision in Boise, Idaho that, that I'll just touch on. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, for sleeping on public spaces, it made it uh, difficult to, um, enforce local laws uh, unless a city established a place where people could sleep. They couldn't be site cited for sleeping in public spaces. Um, so I think until that is established as a, a place where people can go, then 
other areas are kind of up for grabs, but there are sensitive habitats, the marsh, the forest counts too, where I think the city may be looking at um, restricting those areas from, from camping. But un unfortunately, there's a lot of homeless individuals in the area that, that um, do reside in parts of the forest and marsh and wetlands and other, other city open spaces, county open spaces, state lands, etc. So it's, it's a, that's a difficult part of the social, of that three-legged stool, economic, ecological, and social. Because frankly, sleeping in the forest has an ecological downside <laughs> to habitat and water quality. Okay, this is same from Rita. Mark, look, can I just ask, um, Arcata does have homeless uh, shelters. There are places for people. Um, is that is it considered it's just not enough? I, I'm familiar with the ruling, but I'm just yeah. wondering if we just considered that we just don't have enough for the homeless population. And I don't want to misrepresent things because, you know, I'm a retired annuitant helping with certain parts of the forest, but not this part anymore. Um, so I'm not sure what the latest would be. Uh, I'd check in with the city manager, Karen Deemer, Emily Sinkhorn, the environmental services director to, to see what, what action is going on there. I know the city um, municipal code pertaining to public lands and parks, you know, we had a draft just, just to bring it up to modern standards. It had a lot of weird things in there about untethered livestock and um, some antiquated things in it. So that was part of it. Part of it was updating that, you know, camping part, um, but it hasn't gone through yet. I mean, there are facilities, like you say, um, are they are they adequate? I don't, I don't know, or is it enough to where an ordinance um, could have an effect? Um, and also the, the, the police department, I mean, chief, uh, a Ahern would would know more about where the city is heading with that, but it's 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 a tricky issue and it's not it's not solved that I know that I know of. There used to be um, rangers that would go through the forest and check out areas. I don't I haven't seen any for a couple of years now. Are they still monitoring the forest like that? Yes, they are. I mean, there are rules and regs that apply to the forest and. Um, mm -hmm. And camping isn't just tolerated. I mean, pe pe people are um, contacted. So if there's if there's there's an issue, um, they're told to move. Yeah, they're they yeah they're encouraged to move. Yeah. And there's other yeah. things, litter, litter, you know, and you know, water quality impacts. So yes, the Rangers and the Arcata Police Department still do patrol the forest and respond when there's issues. You skipped a question. Is there a plan for the J Jacoby Creek Forest? What goes on there? Oh, that's, I'm sorry. That forest, yeah, it's part of the Arcata Forest Management Plan. Uh, currently, what goes on there? There's a lot of wildlife there, including Northern Spotted Owls, Fisher, um, it's, it's a wildlife rich place. It's, it has um, cur no, currently no recreational access. It's used for education and research and field trips. The city tries to get people up there with, with um, docent led walks periodically. Um, in terms of public access, the road up Jacoby Creek traverses a few public properties. So the city has its access for management to its lands, but that doesn't translate to full bore public access. So it, it's, it's with permit by permit basis right now. For example, the Weah tribe has a, you know, permit to go whenever they want for cultural reasons. And you display that on your windshield and Cal Poly Humboldt, College of the Redwoods, science courses, natural resources courses, do the same, so it's by permit right now until um, some sort of regional access can happen. But even with that, there are members of the Forest Management Committee who, who worry about too much public access up there. 
based upon the high quality wildlife habitat um, and what that could mean, you know, in terms of, um, you know, think of the Arcata Marsh and wildlife sanctuary. Okay, it's a wildlife sanctuary, but when, how many people shown up there in a day kind of tip the scale against wildlife, right? There, there, may, there may be some impacts associated with people in Jacoby Creek. There is plenty of illegal access or trespass that goes on up there, but not the camping issue hasn't been one of those issues, it's mostly mountain bike riding. But it's a spectacular place and hopefully the city can work with Cal Poly Humboldt and others to, to create additional access points and, and a management. And the County of Humboldt really should be involved in terms of that because it's mostly unincorporated um, in the county unincorporated area. So surrounded by county residents, not Arcata residents. But that old 535 acre core Arcata forest that was purchased in 1918, uh, 1914 for 18,000, I'm sorry. Um, no, 1944, I'm getting my wires crossed, 1944. That was established by legis the state legislature as part of the city limits, even though it's an island, you know, it's not connected to the rest of the city. So that's the only city limits part of the Jacoby Creek Forest is that initial 535 acres. What's the prognosis of the community forest health and resilience over time? I think it's pretty good because of the way it's been managed. Um, you know, using old growth conditions to mimic, you know, the, the trajectory of evolution of the forest. So I think as long as monitoring and feedback that the city gets from its wildlife in the monitoring and its water quality and, um, and the public perception, as long as those are all working, then I think it's, it's on a good trajectory. But, but like I mentioned earlier, the whole effect of doubling the CO2 level in the atmosphere since I was, I started college basically. It's changed everything um, in terms of what, what we might expect in the future, um, but probably less so for the redwoods like as compared to everywhere else in the West, everywhere else in the country, everywhere else in Alaska, we're, we're, in, the, we're in a sweet spot that may may be the least impacted, but it's definitely going to be impacted and is being impacted. Forest plan that's going through internal review and the sequel document that goes with it. Um, by the way, the McKay Community Forest Plan or stewardship plan is, is out now on, on the county's website. You, you can look at that. It talks about the Arcata Community Forest and the history of the forest because it's it's trying to do a similar um, management in terms of civil culture and, and other things. So I don't think the draft plan is on the city's website right now, but it will be. And it's an update from the 1994 plan which I must say was heavily influenced by the Northwest Forest Plan at the time, which kind of um, involved all the Spotted Owl National Forests and BLM forests in Northern Cal, Oregon and Washington in terms of that late successional you know, direction and ecological forestry, the kinder, gentler type forestry that um, Arcata really grabbed that Northwest Forest Plan as kind of a, a the goals and objectives some are, are almost directly derived from that that effort. Who put that together? Which the city's plan? No, the Northwest Forest Plan. Uh, it was about 300 scientists mostly and policy folks back during um, 
the Clinton administration. Okay, thank you. Can you go from Weston Road to the Rich Trail? No, but you can, out of five miles, there's a quarter mile that's not complete yet in the middle. So you can almost do it. You can go from one direction to the other and turn around, but it's not yet connected. Where is the, where is the missing piece? Is it, it, crosses, it, it crosses Fickle Hill Road, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that, that was always been tricky because you, you're trying to find, a, you know, with the little skinny land that the city had, a, a, a great crossing, you know, for safety. It has safety mechanisms built into it. Um, but it's, you know, it creates some challenges from the south to the north in terms of um, slope and, and grade. But, you know, I think it'll be a, a feature that people will embrace. There was a lot of uh, fundraising that went around this, this trail, but mostly that was for helping leverage grants for, for land acquisition where parts of the trail were gonna be situated, so. And there's so, a um, question about wildlife. Oh. Have you noticed changes in wildlife living in the forest over the years? The biggest change is barred owls have displaced the Northern spotted owls and um, that's unfortunate. They kind of moved here from the East Coast. They are not a native species locally, but they skipped and jumped across the country. They're probably, you know, the Great Plains used to be a barrier, but there's so much urban forest and the ability to make it here, uh, or they came from the North and dropped, dropped down the coast. Um, so they displaced the Northern Spotted Owl. And um, that's been the biggest, but, you know, having fishers uh, and, and now we have game cameras out there. Um, we, we see a lot more <laughs> stuff that maybe we never saw before. So in terms of wildlife habitat, um, as the forest matures, we've noticed that being used by other species that prefer that older stand structure uh, as com compared to a younger younger stand. So, so that's probably the most notable. Um, and we used to go for long periods of time without seeing mountain lions, and now it's doesn't take that long. <laughs> so we see mountain lion more often. Are there any other questions? We've done a pretty good job of keeping him busy for another <laughs> half You hour. did, you tacked, you, I should have anticipated that had less. I warned you. <laughs> I know, that's fun. Um, well, we're, we're so appreciative of everything you've done in the past to create this wonder for us. We use it almost every day. Um, I don't know how many others do, but it is an incredible gift and treasure for the city um and and you've done a magnificent job with it for the years you've been involved and it's been since what the 1980s i think uh, 1980, 1984. yeah i yep. mean it's amazing and and we could go into so much more detail i could ask a dozen more questions i won't do that we'll let you go but we want to thank you ever ever so much for your time and your work and Everybody can clap or say hi or whatever. And um, if you have further questions, of course, or want to see parts of this you missed, you can see the video within a couple of days, which will be online on our website. So we appreciate everything you've done. And since Dane had to leave, he told me how to end this. So we'll see if it happens. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so Thank you much. So much. Thank you. Wonderful. Appreciate it. Thanks for thanks for participating. Yeah. Our, Thank you. My pleasure. It's been amazing. Yeah, it's been amazing. Yeah, it's been amazing. Really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, everybody's welcome.
Marilyn uh, Tucker, who used to live on Pickle Hill, commented to me yesterday, I think it was, or the day before, that she had contacted the, the city, what, how many years ago? And offered to provide, I think, an easement on the edge of her property. And nobody responded. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Is I it don't... too late? Oh, she... Is it too late? Yeah, she <laughs> sold it years ago. Oh, uh, <laughs> dang. Oh. Um. What what a bummer! Oh, well. that one. You've gotten lots of other opportunities, so right. and you've taken advantage of them. So I hope hope you can work that out uh, with one of the landowners over there. I know it's a difficult you know, issue. The, the, there's three. There are three in the works right now, and you know, it's at some point the city will grow a little bit, and you know, the the, the forest will hopefully benefit from expanding now because yeah, there's going to be there's going to be pressures especially on the county side i think to cut off potential access points it, it, it's hard it's hard to come up with access points that's that's been the biggest challenge that are safe you mean yeah 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 i get it all right well thank you ever so much marilyn did you want to say something no, I was just going to say that was a really long time ago because horses, uh, people like to ride their horses to our property and we had a great entrance to the forest. We love the forest up there, but we're not there now. <laughs> I, rec I recognize your name. Uh, hopefully I, I didn't blow it by. <laughs> I think this is back in the 1990s, wasn't it, Marilyn? It was probably in the probably in the eighties or earlier. Oh, okay. Well, maybe he wasn't here yet. <laughs> yeah. okay, I don't yeah. think he'd normally miss an opportunity like that. It was that. probably yeah. just before you came. <laughs> yeah, it must have been that. Yeah. Yeah, he would have jumped on it, I'm sure. So anyway, anyway. I I had fun, you know. <clears throat> okay, thank you. We're all leaving now, and I'm hey. hitting N. I said that's the magic button, so we'll find Thank out. You. <laughs> Take care.